I am not Ritika Kaushik, uh, as much as I would like to have her skill and knowledge and sensibility, but she, some bug got to her, and I have to step in and moderate tonight's event. But it's a pleasure to do it, because tonight's guest is another one of our moderators and my co-curator of this series, uh, Daniel uh, Fairfax. Um, who it has been my privilege to work with closely in various constellations on, on a variety of projects for, I would say, more going on 15 years now. Yeah. Uh, we started collaborating when Danny was still a doctoral candidate at Yale in film studies. When, um, <clears throat> together with his supervisor, Dudley Andrew, we started a uh, publication project on the history of film theories. And the idea is to translate into English, or as our friend and French colleague Jacques Aumont likes to call it, the language of the empire, um, texts from the history of film theory that are not uh, yet accessible in English. And um, to get that project started, translations are notoriously difficult to finance. And to get that um, project started, we needed to have very skillful translators who spoke several languages fluently, but were native English speakers and had an interest in film theory and could translate those works. And um, <clears throat> when we talked about the project, Dudley said to me, I have someone who fits that profile. And that was Danny Fairfax, who was at the time working on a dissertation on the history of uh, French film criticism after 1968, after the sort of the Maoist revolutionary turn of the Cahiers du Cinema and uh, the, the big events of 68, which changed everything and changed the fate and direction of theory, including uh, film theory. And um, when Danny was done with the dissertation, uh, we in Frankfurt were lucky enough to have a position that we could offer him. And he's been working with us as an assistant professor, uh, teaching, writing, organizing conferences, organizing film series um, uh, ever since. Um, uh, for six years now, we've had the privilege of working with him, and it's going to continue for quite a bit. Um, in the meantime, Danny's two-volume history of the Cahiers du Cinema after 1968 has been published. Uh, it's called The Red Years uh, of the Cahiers du Cinema, uh, a very, very comprehensive work of not just the history of film criticism, but also meta-criticism, if you will, a criticism, a critique of criticism. Um, you have no excuse not to read it because it's an open access and you can download it from the Amsterdam University website. It's a great reading pleasure and you shouldn't miss out on it. Um, what the book will also show you is uh, it's a testament to one of the qualities of Danny as a friend, a colleague, a teacher, um, and one of the qualities that um, our students at the university have been benefiting from and appreciating uh, ever since he came here, uh, which is his unparalleled knowledge of the history of world cinema. Um, this is not someone who you can surprise with an idea for a lecture in film. He will tell you which films on any subject he would preferably choose uh, because he has seen most of them or knows about them sufficiently to give a qualified uh, judgment or pass a qualified judgment on them. So what I'm trying to convey to you is the daily pleasure of having Danny as a colleague and as a co-organizer of our events, as an intellectual companion, and as someone, we're actually doing a book together right now, uh, which is also on the post-68 um, <clears throat> uh, developments in French film criticism. It's a tribute to one of the key texts of that period, Cinema Ideolo Ideology Criticism, co-written by Jean Arboni and Jean-Louis uh, Jean Comoli. And uh, <clears throat> whatever Danny hasn't said in his book, and he has said pretty much everything, but there are a few footnotes that remain, is going to be in that book, which hopefully will come out later this year. Tonight, uh, with Danny, we return to the Urban Trilogy, uh, which is one of the pièces de résistance, cornerstones in the oeuvre of Chateau uh, Ray, the three urban uh, culture, urban young male films 
um, from the late 60s and early 70s, which distinguished them, themselves from the rest of the oeuvre of uh, Ray, among other things, uh, because they have male protagonists and are set in contemporary urban environments. Whereas uh, one of the recurring themes that we've been coming back to and will come back to as the series progresses is that in Ray, just as in Bengali literature of the 19th and 20th century, uh, important, complex, interesting, challenging uh, female figures uh, play a central role. Um, this one is about class struggle, at least in Danny's reading. And I'm very uh, uh, much looking forward to hearing what your take on Company Limited or Sima Bada from 1971 is. The podium is yours. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Vincent. Thank you so much, Vincent, for that uh, excessively uh, praise, praiseful introduction. Uh, yeah, if you like reading 800-page PDFs, then you can download my book for free. Uh, if not, it's a hefty sum, so you're kind of caught in between. Um, I would say, Vincent, you said I, do, I speak all these languages perfectly, but my German is uh, often prone to what we could call Versprecher, uh, that sometimes embarrass myself. Uh, so I'll be talking in English. Uh, but I also wanted to focus on this particular word, double take, because I don't know if the German translation in the pamphlet quite captured that, a doppelter blick, because a double take is something quite specific. Uh, double take here on class relations, but a double take, I'll, I'll do a double take. Uh, this is hard because I'm not an actor, but it's like this. That's a double take. Uh, you're all to clap and applaud me uh, for my wonderful acting performance. But this is a kind of, uh, you know, the moment where you, you do a take and then you look away and then you do another take. And it's like you suddenly see what you hadn't seen before. You see things in a different way or a different light or they kind of appear anew to you uh, upon the second take. And so I'm getting this idea actually from Ravi Vasudevan, who was here earlier, and he talks about Satyajit Ray's work as a double take on modernity. Uh, again, that Satyajit Ray's films can be, can be seen as reflections on modernity that can appear in one way, if you look at it from one angle and then in a kind of totally different way, like whether it's a critique of, a, of modernity or a celebration of modernity or kind of uh, somehow it kind of becomes both or it's kind of nostalgic about the lost past as well as also very critical about what that lost past actually represented. Uh, I'm taking that concept and applying it here in the case of Sima Bada by Satyajit Ray to the kind of question of class relations included in which is, of course, class struggle. Uh, and we'll see a little bit later how that kind of unfolds. What I would say, just to, just to link it to the research project that I was involved in that uh, Vincent's mentioned on Kaya de Cinema is that Satyajit Ray is one of the big... Uh, gaps in the Kaya de Cinema of the period after 1968, Indian cinema as a whole, actually, uh, the, the big exception, and it shows a kind of certain French mentality here, was Louis Malle's Calcutta film, which they detested, rightfully so, uh, but they really needed to be seeing films like Seema Bada, uh, I think, to get a, an, an insight into well, what was going on in India, and given the day themselves were Maoists, maybe that could have, at this particular point in time, 1971, uh, maybe that could have given them an, a bit of an insight into their own politics at the time. Um, but we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. Uh, as Vincent's mentioned, this film is part of the, you could call it the Urban Trilogy, you could call it the Calcutta Trilogy because they, are, they all take place in the city of Calcutta, obviously uh, in West Bengal, a place where Satyajit Ray is very closely associated with. Now, the chronological order in which these three films were made is... So, uh, the first film, Pratid One Day, The Adversary from 1970. Sima Bada comes second chronologically in 1971. And then five years later, we get the third installment in the trilogy with Jana, Jana Aranya, the middleman. Um, that's the order in which the films were made. However, I would argue that the order in which to understand the films, in a sense, uh, in a kind of narrative or even biographical level, is, thankfully enough, and this is kind of completely random, I don't think we really planned it like this, but is in the same order that we've been watching them. For those of you who were here in previous screenings, that is to say, firstly, Pratid Wandi uh, from 1970, then Jana Aranya as the second film, which was also the second film we watched, and then Seema Bada as the final film. Because in a sense, these films tell 
a unified biographical story about a single character, uh, a man who's trying to establish himself in the world of the neo-bourgeoisie, one could call it, the kind of newly rising uh, professional class, and struggles with this rise. In Pratidwandi, we have a, a kind of, um, let's say, the, the, the struggle to, you know, the struggle immediately after graduation, struggle to even find any kind of uh, gain, gainful employment, uh, going through the interview phases and so on and so forth. Uh, in Jana Aranya, the middleman, we see someone who's initially confronted with that, uh, with that problem, with that issue, and then kind of through kind of act of supreme self-debasement, essentially, manages somehow to kind of get a, his toe in the door. And then finally in Sima Bada, we see someone who has supposedly made it, who's kind of become a successful man uh, in the corporate world. But of course, it's not so simple as that. Uh, one thing to unite the, or what, I mean, alongside this kind of biographical unity, let's say, or this biographical coherence uh, to the three films, I think there is also a very deep thematic coherence to them and I would argue that there's this kind of triple crisis uh, or kind of structuring crisis uh, inherent to all three films. There's a crisis of masculinity that I think we see very clearly. People who are in the uh, uh, here for the last two films in the trilogy uh, would of course already seen this. There is the crisis of precisely this, this nascent or ascendant professional middle class or the crisis of how do you belong to this class? How do you how do you ascertain or ensure your status within this class in conditions that are, let's say, distinctly precarious or distinctly kind of difficult to to retain without really kind of, let's say, I mean, such a jitsuray position is in, in a sense without uh, corrupting yourself or debasing yourself completely. And then finally, we have this kind of political crisis that is taking place in, in particular in West Bengal uh, at the time, which is precisely the Naxalite insurgency, so this Maoist uprising initially in the countryside amongst peasant amongst the peasantry of the region, but then spreading to the to the cities in particular amongst the kind of student far left at this time. Uh, and the the Naxalite insurgency has been, I think, mentioned uh, lightly or in passing in previous lectures, but. Uh, given what that's, this is my like mastermind specialty subject, uh, sectarian left wing politics around the world, I'm going to do a bit of a, I'm going to indulge myself with a bit of a deep dive into some of the political, uh, let's say, details of precisely what was going on in West Bengal uh, at this time. Um, so I just wanted to also, I mean, to kind of bolster my argument uh, of this, this, is, this, this, these three films are essentially showing a single character kind of in different phases of, the, of his life. There are, of course, three distinct characters played by three different actors. Here we have the protagonist of Pratid Wandi, uh, Jutuman Chatterjee as uh, Siddhartha. Uh, I think he delivered an, an amazing performance. I mean, this was really, he's a really uh, magnetic figure on the screen and also kind of a very, um, let's say, empathetic figure. I mean, I, I, like, I felt for this guy uh, to a large degree. Uh, in Jana Aranya, we have Pradeep Mukherjee as uh, Somnath, uh, kind of, you know, almost a kind of bridging figure between, uh, between Siddhartha in, in uh, Pratidwandi and then the, the man that we will be encountering today, uh, Baron Chanda, who plays the protagonist of Sima Bada. Uh, uh, a man who goes by the name of Shyamalendu Chatterjee. Uh, Baron Chanda himself is a very interesting figure. He was born in Dhaka at that time, uh, part of uh, you know, British India, though obviously, as we all know, uh, later becomes part of Bangladesh and he leaves uh, to, to West Bengal, to Calcutta. There is kind of a conflicting information about his date of birth, uh, some sources give it as 1939, others give, us a, give it as 1945. He himself, though, wrote that when he made this film, he had just turned 30. So I'm going to give credence more to the 1939 date. I don't know where 1945 emerged, but it seems to be quite commonly found. He's trying to pass himself off as younger than he really is, perhaps. Um, certainly the character he plays is someone who is distinctly 
in his 30s, uh, as opposed to the characters in Pratidwandi and Jana Aranya, who are still in their 20s, still kind of just emerging from their university years. Uh, Baron Chanda's uh, Shyama Lendu is, he's established himself in the corporate world already, like now for, for something like a decade, as we learn in the film. Uh, Baron Chanda himself, though, at the time that the film was made, was not a professional actor, uh, which is actually quite striking because he, he has a real screen presence. I think he has a, a genuine charisma on the, on the screen. Uh, but he actually himself worked for an advertising company, Clarion. Uh, in this sense, he shares a biographical past uh, with Satyajit Ray because Ray himself worked as a kind of visualizer for an advertising firm for a while. So coming up with kind of, I guess, the key art for uh, promotion campaigns. Satyajit Ray himself was only briefly, I guess, involved in the advertising world for Baron Chanda, though it was quite a long uh, profession. He dabbled in theatre acting younger, when in his younger days, let's say, but did not consider himself in any way like a professional actor or that acting was his vocation. Nonetheless, uh, very interested in Satyajit Ray's films and uh, so was trying to kind of get his toe in the door maybe to somehow feature in a Satyajit Ray film. This Seema Bada was his first film... Uh, of any director and his strategy for auditioning for Ray for uh for a part in a Ray film he initially wanted a part in Pratid Wandi uh didn't get it and then kind of managed to kind of wheedle his way into uh Sima Bada. but his strategy was essentially to uh, ask Satyajit Ray for an interview this is a, a piece of advice for you know all you budding actors out there if you want to like get in the good books of your favorite director so you can be like the star of their next movie. Just uh, hit them up and say, oh, can I interview you for like the local newspaper? Uh, and then they get to know you and then figure out that you're like the perfect person for the role that they're casting in their next film. This is essentially his idea. In Baron Chanda's kind of account of this encounter with Ray, it was a complete disaster. He brought along a tape recorder with him so he could record the interview. The tape recorder didn't work. Ray looked at him like he was a moron. It was like, you have, what kind of an interviewer doesn't even know how to make their tape recorder work? Like, who are you? What kind of an amateur are you? Uh, they then nonetheless spoke for uh, a lengthy amount of time. He had no recording of it, so he just like would take, took little notes of his pencil and then turned it into an interview, which he Ray then explicitly said, send me the interview first before you publish it so that I can check over my remarks. You know, most people do or ask to do this. A lot of people ask to do this. He didn't do that either. He was like, no, I'm just going to publish it. Who cares? Like, it'll be all right. Uh, so published his kind of faint memories of what Satyajit Ray said without Satyajit Ray even having like right of approval over this. Uh, very risky proposition and yet somehow it worked like printed the interview Ray was happy with it and he said all right do you want to be in my film uh, and this is how <laughs> this is how Baron Chanda uh, became Shia Melendu in uh, in Seema Bada uh, he actually gained a kind of a cult reputation on the basis of this film um, and you'll, I think you'll see how I mean he's, he does have a very striking uh, screen presence. Uh, nonetheless, this was his only acting part for the next 20 years. He then just goes back to working uh, in advertising, doesn't seem to have any interest f uh, in acting again. Then somehow in the early 90s, he decides, oh, I'll give it another try and uh, starts acting in films. And then in the 2000s, becomes an extremely prolific actor uh, and actually extremely well-known in, uh, uh, in, in Indian cinema. Uh, just kind of very late in life, uh, starts working on a, on a very regular basis in films. Uh, interestingly enough, very recently, uh, he said he was uh, bored during uh, the COVID lockdown, so he needed something to do, wanted to leave the house, uh, and instead decided to write uh, the book Satyajit Ray, The Man Who Knew Too Much, which is a kind of uh, a book-length uh, memoir about his experiences meeting Satyajit Ray, working with him on the film, um, and uh, kind of his impressions of Ray's cinema. An, an excellent, kind of very breezy, excellent read uh, for anyone who's interested in more in the kind of behind the scenes um, workings of the film. Um, so as we know, he plays the protagonist in Sima Bada. The, no the film itself is based on a novel by, or a kind of shortish novel by Mani Shankar Mukherjee. Uh, in that sense, uh, uh, Shankar, as he's kind of known as, also wrote Janya, ja, the novel for, that was the basis for Jana Aranya, so there's something linking those two films. Uh, didn't write Pratit Wandi, so that's kind of 
slightly separate. Uh, the film is nonetheless quite freely adapted, so you know, Ray definitely kind of had his own input into the narrative. Uh, Shia Malendu is depicted as a corporate high flyer, someone who actually, and we'll get into this, had potential in uh, pursuing an academic path, as we'll see, but in the, the but after a very brief period as a teacher decided, no, that's not the, that's not the thing for me. I'm going to join the corporate world instead. That's my, that's my ticket. Uh, and is very successful, uh, kind of, you know, shoots up the corporate pyramid, uh, becomes, uh, by the time we see him in the film, the sales and marketing manager for Hindustan Peters, which is a kind of in Anglo Indian manufacturer of fans and lights. And he's in the fan wing of the company. Uh, and his kind of main rival, uh, in the film is he's kind of equivalent in the light swing. So we have this kind of the fan guy and the light guy. Uh, but I mean, I think it's very interesting that Satyajit Ray depicts what is very clearly a kind of Anglo-Indian company. Uh, so a kind of, you know, a corporate legacy of British colonialism and a kind of, and now a kind of neo-imperialist uh, setup. And this is reflected in the, in the corporate boardroom. There are the kind of the, the holdovers from the from the period of British domination, so they're still kind of British members of the board, but then the kind of newly ascendant Indian uh, members of the kind of corporate hierarchy as well. We also see scenes, for instance, in a kind of uh, a, a, like a what, I guess a country club that kind of has a swimming pool, and they note that oh, up until ten years ago, Indians weren't even allowed here. Now now everyone's allowed here as long as you have the money, right? This is the this is the new. Um, let's say, meal ticket for success. Uh, Baron Chanda's uh, Shia Malendu is, uh, in the film, an extremely, oh, I would say, at least in my judgment, uh, handsome, suave, and charismatic individual. Uh, he leads a very prosperous lifestyle. I mean, he's very handsomely rewarded for his corporate position, lives in this kind of very well-appointed modern apartment, and it's very clearly depicted as kind of like the, the height of modernity, the height of modern living, uh, has become, and you know, the film indicates to us this is perhaps not, has not always been the case with him, but certainly by the time we get to know him, has become distinctly status and money obsessed. Uh, he is very focused on how much money people are earning, not just himself, but other people, uh, and also fat, focus on the kind of let's say, the attributes or the accoutrements of status, whether it is being able to go into this kind of country club that used to be the preserve only of the British, uh, or even the ability to actually physically occupy the boardroom, where, like, this is, look at this, like, there's a scene in the film where it shows, I mean, like, the boardroom, like, this is where I could be if I get that promotion that I'm really looking for. Uh, he's also married. Uh, we get the sense it's not, like, a particularly, um, let's say, it's not a marriage with like a lot of fireworks, uh, perhaps, uh, and has a child who's seven years old, but has been placed in boarding school in Darjeeling, which is probably for me the saddest moment of the film where they read the letter that their kid has sent. Of, Why would you do this to your kid? Uh, so, I mean, this is like also this kind of psychological relic of British imperialism, like the idea of sending your child to a boarding school and there's absolutely no need to do so. And this kid is writing letters uh, back to them, they barely see uh, they barely see their own kid. Um, nonetheless, in this portrait I have painted for you of uh, Shaima Lendu's character, you might be recognizing someone else from a more recent, let's say, manifestation of popular culture, namely this guy. Essentially, my one my little argument here. This is not not the main focus of my talk. Uh, is that Shai Melendu is, in a sense, John Draper from Mad Men, who you all know. Uh, I even ask myself if perhaps the makers of Mad Men might have seen Shai, uh, might have seen Seema Bada, because the parallels seem pretty, pretty striking. Um, so, and when watching it, it was it's hard not to think of a kind of him as a, a kind of Don Draper esque character. If you if you know the show, but I assume all of you know the show. Um, Shai Melendu, uh, I mentioned he was married, uh, the, the woman he's married to is Dolan, played by Paramita Chowdhury, uh, who is depicted in the film, possibly a little bit unfairly, I don't know, we can talk about that, but she doesn't come off well in the film, she's depicted as a very superficial woman who's primarily attracted to the glamorous lifestyle that Shai Melendu can offer through his corporate position. There is some indication that uh, perhaps she had more going for her in the past, 
uh, but she seems to have kind of been kind of dragged into this situation of a, or like, let's say the kind of gilded cage of a, uh, the housewife of a corporate hotshot, uh, whose main interests in life are like shopping and going out to bars and so on and so forth. Um, they actually knew each other by dint of the fact that she was the daughter of his literature professor when he was studying in their hometown of Patna, uh, where Shai Melendu himself was actually the star pupil. He's presented in a kind of prologue of the film as like, he got the gold medal in uh, English literature at the university. He was all set for the kind of academic pathway. And then a few days into uh, his teaching job, then just kind of flees the coop and uh and goes to calcutta well go like join kind of applies for work in the corporate sector and kind of ends up in calcutta instead uh in the film though this couple are uh, visited by shai Malendu's sister-in-law so Dolan's sister uh who goes by the name sudasana or tutu tutu kind of a nickname i guess or kind of uh, a kid name for uh, for Sudasana, but she mainly goes by the name of Tutu uh, in, in the actual film, at least uh, by the other characters, uh, who is played by Shamila Tagore, one of the great actresses of Indian cinema, someone we just saw last week in Devi, uh, someone, you know, kind of from the Tagore family, so, you know, one of the real kind of uh, elite families of India, of Indian culture, um, and also is very, very, uh, let's say, impressive in this film. Uh, she comes to visit them. Uh, she's still living in Patna. She's younger uh, than Dolan, uh, distinctly younger, it appears. And uh, she comes to visit. They haven't seen her in quite a few years. Uh, and indeed, Shia Melendu is struck by, oh, like last time I saw you, you were just a little kid. Now you're a grown up woman. Uh, and, you know, it's like foreboding of things to come, perhaps. Uh, but in the course of the film, they kind of show her around town. They show her the lifestyle that they now had. They take her out to clubs and parties and drinks with their friends. They go to the swimming pool and the country club. They even go to the race course. These are all, all the trappings of this kind of, the, the lifestyle of the modern uh, corporate bourgeoisie in uh, the Calcutta of 1971. Um, as I mentioned, Shia Melendu is also aiming for a promotional angling, let's say, for a promotion as an opening in the boardroom, so to become company director. Uh, he has a, just a just kind of magnetic attraction to the physical space of the border, which is quite strange, but it's also showing kind of where his uh, head is at. Uh, and yes, he's, he's got a rival for this position, so he's really on edge about, like, is it going to happen for him? Which also shows that he's still, you know, very much still in the logic that the protagonists, like Siddhartha in um, Pratidwandi and... and um, uh, his uh, counterpart in Jana Aranya, uh, even though it seems like Shai Malendu has, has made it. He's got the job that they're all wanting. Like he's, you know, extremely well paid. He's got the wife and the kid and everything seems fine uh, for him, but he's still stuck in this rat race mentality. They're like, you know, he wants the promotion. He wants to be company. He doesn't want to just be the marketing manager at the company. He wants to be in the boardroom. He wants to be a director. Uh, and that's what he's really like fixated on in the film. Uh, in order to, let's say, guarantee his production, or in order to wow the company directors and so that they know that he is really the, the like, inarguably the one for, to get this promotion, uh, Shai Melendu needs to seal the deal with an export consignment of 10,000 fans uh, to Iraq, uh, which is interesting detail there. I mean, obviously also shows the uh, continuation of the kind of old colonial trading links of the British Empire, Iraq, also a former uh, British colony. And, you know, there's kind of now trade going on between these nominally independent nations, but this is a, you know, still British dominated company, Hindustan Peters, uh, presumably selling fans to, you know, Iraqi equivalent. Uh, and he ne all he needs to do is make sure that this deal goes through, that they uh, manage to, uh, you know, get the shipment of these fans over to Iraq and everything's fine. The payment goes through and then it's, it's done. And this, even this, this shipment itself becomes something of a kind of advertising uh, campaign for the company. It's like, look at us, look how great our fans are, or even like sending them off to Iraq. Even Iraqis want our fans. Um, this is how great they are. So it, everything is dependent on this deal happening for, for you know, in Shai Melinda's mind, at least for his life to all work out. Uh, a problem arises, however. There is a manufacturing defect in the fans. The paint was not applied properly. Uh, and the 
this could thwart the entire deal. The, the Iraqi company won't accept them if they're defective parts. Uh, the shipment wouldn't go through. And this would thwart Shai Melendez's ascent up the corporate hierarchy. The deal would be over. The company would have to pay a massive kind of, you know, late payment, late delivery fee and so on and so forth. And his name would be mud in the company. It's like, how could you let this happen? Like, how could you be so irresponsible that you let this uh, it doesn't seem to actually be his fault, but he certainly internalizes it as his responsibility that this uh, defect uh, has has occurred. Then he lights on a brilliant idea. There's a get out clause. When an act of God happens, uh, this can trigger a kind of automatic delay to the contract and he can get the kind of extension needed so that they can rectify the defect and uh, send the delivery on late, but they've still done it, and they're not going to be you know, hit with this kind of late delivery fee uh, that would kind of thwart the entire deal. Act of God. What is that? That could, be, that could be a hurricane. That could be a flood. That could be some major natural disaster. Or it could be a strike by the workers of the factory. This is also an act of God, strange, at least in, terms, in the terms of the contract. And it dawns on Shai Melendu that he, you know, he can't create a hurricane. He can't create a flood you know, or a, like a massive fire or something. But it's, is it really beyond his capabilities to manufacture a disturbance among his own factory or the workers in his own company's factory that would lead to a strike in the factory that would then activate this act of God clause? Yeah, maybe... Maybe he could pull that up. Maybe he could do that. Uh, and this is, uh, I mean, mainly the se in the second part of the film, after about an hour, we show, the, or we are shown this Machiavellian scheme uh, hatched by Shia Melendu to see dissent among the workers uh, behind the scenes, kind of setting out uh, his minions to, to kind of, um, you know, uh, so... Uh, disharmony amongst the, the factory workers. All right. Uh, which then is, is very kind of, it pull, is pulled off with a plong. Uh, the workers are ready to strike. They go on strike. They're all in. Uh, even if, you know, unbeknownst to them, this is actually this kind of calculating scheme by this member of the corporate hierarchy. Uh, it's almost too successful because it culminates actually in a bombing in the factory, which uh, leads to a security guard being uh, seriously wounded. Uh, and yeah, Shai Melendu is, I mean, I'm, you know, some spoilers here, but nonetheless, he's a little bit, little bit guilty about this security guard who gets like, you know, totally disfigured. Uh, but he pretty quickly shrugs that off. His plan works perfectly. He gets the promotion, joins the board of uh, directors, and like everything's gravy for our friend Shai Melendu. But I guess the question is, has, I mean, it's a pretty obvious question. Has Shai Melendu sacrificed his own moral integrity in his pursuit of the corporate rat race? Has he basically signed something of his own uh, Faustian pact? Uh, and I think this, was, this film is often kind of spoken of in terms of a kind of uh, Faustian pact. Uh, so that's one kind of, I guess, question that the film poses in pretty flagrant terms. The other question it poses, though, is perhaps a more incendiary hypothesis from Ray, which is, you know, remember, this is this moment of very pitched political and class struggle in, in the region, in West Bengal in particular. There is, there's, you know, Peasant war, students uh, engaging in bombing campaigns, uh, there's workers' strikes going on uh, all over the place. Uh, and what the film shows us is a workers' struggle, a very pitched class struggle in a very frontal manner that is, in fact, the whole time being manipulated uh, behind the scenes by the bourgeoisie itself, by the kind of, you know, someone who's kind of part of this kind of corporate uh, managerial layer for their own strategic ends. This is, you know, in the context of, you know, it's very pitched political situation uh, is perhaps a little bit of a controversial take to, uh, to have uh, on the part of Satyajit Ray. Uh, but I want to I get into a little bit of a parenthetical right now, which is precisely what's going on uh, in West Bengal uh, at the time. Uh, one thing to note 
about uh, about the region is that it was really it has historically always been the stronghold of the Indian communist movement, uh, and in this sense is actually rather similar to uh, Kerala. Uh, these are the two, I guess, strongholds of uh, of Indian communism. I actually have here a map of the uh, 1971 national election results uh, in India that shows India at this time still pretty much a one-party state uh, in most of the country by the Indian Congress, the, the kind of light blue uh, party here. But you have these two red blocks, which is one uh, in the um, northeast with West Bengal and then another one in the southwest uh, with Kerala. Um, and you see here that the communist... Uh, the various different communist fractions, because there were a few of them, which we'll get into, uh, in West Bengal, quite dominant, even and in Kerala as well, quite uh, present. Uh, nonetheless, uh, let's say West Bengali and Kerala politics were quite distinct. Kerala is the kind of, it's like the peaceful version of what communist politics could be like. Uh, essentially, they were responsible for establishing a kind of, you know, quite social democratic uh I guess, political setup uh, with a kind of peaceful alternation uh, with the Indian Congress. Like every, you know, pretty much every, every electoral cycle or two, they kind of change or well, exchange power. There's a kind of two-party state, essentially, in Kerala uh, with very peaceful transitions uh, between the two fractions. Uh, this is not the case at all in West Bengal, uh, certainly during this period of the kind of late 1960s and early 1970s. It's much more unstable, politically much more fractious. Uh, the Communist Party itself was uh, had been electorally popular in the region since 1957, where it already was kind of getting figures of something, more than 30% of the vote. Uh, in 1967, uh, for the first time, a communist-led United Front coalition government uh, assumed power. This was a kind of coalition of communist parties and uh, kind of non-communist, but kind of, I guess, sympathetic parties that finally enabled a break with Congress rule, who had kind of ruled West Bengal since independence. Uh, but in the period 1967 to 1972, have a kind of immense period of instability. There, I mean, elections are supposed to take place every five years, but instead they take place in 1967, 1969, 1971, 1972, because there, were no, there was no stable governing coalition. Uh, the, the communist movement itself was incredibly divided in and itself. Uh, and it was there was constant like shifts in um, uh, power blocks uh, at this time. From 1972 to 1977, you have the return of the, of Congress to power. But then, uh, interesting enough, from 1977 to very recently, in fact, 2011, the CPIM, the Communist Party of India, uh, Marxist, uh, leads a so-called left front uh, and is actually in power for uh, 34 years. Uh, so wins every election. For the spe uh, over the course of 34 years until finally losing power in 2011. And since then, it's actually been reduced to uh, almost nothing uh, in, uh, in the region, it's, at least in terms of uh, its electoral force. Uh, the various communist parties though, in India today still have more than 2 million members when put together. So they are still quite numerous in terms of their membership. They're still very visibly present on the streets of certainly parts of India. Um, and there's, you know, West Bengal is still somehow like has this kind of historical concentration uh, of, of communist militancy. Uh, but I think one of the big weaknesses uh, precisely in this time was the fact that, that I've alluded to a few times already that it was not a monolithic party. There was a communist movement, but it was divided along multiple lines kind of, you know, an ever-increasing, like, uh, factional split. The first such split occurred in 1964 between just the, you know, Communist Party of India and its minority faction, the Communist Party of India, of India Marxist. The CPI itself was pro-Soviet and the CPI-M was Maoist. Uh, and this split took place in the wake of the Sino-Soviet split, so the split between Khrushchev and Mao that happened in the early 1960s, Mao denouncing Khrushchev as basically a a lackey of imperialism and you know, for his policy of peaceful coexistence and insisting on the uh, need for a kind of uh, revolutionary war against uh, the global bourgeoisie. Uh, so this kind of global split between Mao and Khrushchev is reflected in India uh, in a kind of local split in the party. But interesting enough, even the CPIM itself, which is a nominally Maoist faction of the, of the Communist Party of India, was still relatively moderate within the, you know, the communist um, kind of uh, 
let's say, sphere at least. Uh, under the leadership of Jayoti Basu, uh, it still was oriented to parliamentary politics and kind of attempting to wield power through winning elections. This led then to a further split in 1967 between, within the CPIM, uh, which saw the emergence of the CPIML, the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist. You can see that things are going to start getting a little bit confusing. You have the CPI, the CPIM, CPIML, uh, and the CPIML was a much more militant, let's say, wing of the Maoist movement in particular, which adopted Mao's own strategy of essentially people's war. Uh, starting, in the, starting within the peasantry, the peasantry being the kind of uh, the, the, the first foothold for, I mean, for the Chinese revolution uh, itself. And then Mao kind of advocated uh, exporting this revolutionary strategy to other third world countries, including India and the CPIML, under the, particularly the leadership of Charu Majumda, uh, adopted this position. Charu Majumda himself would be uh, killed in prison in 1972, uh, but kind of then became a kind of martyr like figure for the CPIML. So in 1967, we have the uh, beginning of this kind of people's war strategy by the CPIML. We have a peasant uprising in the uh, district of Naxal Bari, kind of like close to uh, the town of Darjeeling, uh, which is then like the like kind of as a very, um, let's say, high profile insurgency that then spreads uh, really, I mean, across West Bengal, but then also to other parts of the country. Uh, and then also students in like this kind of student left, I guess, in Kata, take inspiration from this uh, uprising to launch their own urban guerrilla campaign, and this is what is called the kind of Naxalite insurgency. Uh, it starts to be repressed by the central government, like the federal government of India, then uh, under Indira Gandhi's uh, leadership in a kind of, I guess, uh, wave of violent repression called Operation Steeplechase. Interestingly enough, though, in the context of West Bengal, the West Bengal government itself reacted very uh, violently against the Naxalite uprising, but the government itself was at this time led by the CPIM. So you have this weird situation in which a uh, government with a Maoist party essentially in power is repressing an, insurg an insurgency by another Maoist uh, political movement that is kind of uh, attempting to kind of uh, overthrow the state. Um, so it gets very messy, let's put it like that. Uh, it's very uh, kind of quite unique political situation at this time. Uh, the CPIML, though, um, suffered a kind of ongoing series of splits. Uh, interestingly enough, the Naxalite insurgency in the broader sense continues right up to the present day. It's still, it's kind of on and off and it's, you know, there have been kind of waves of repression, Operation Green Hunt about 10 or 15 years ago that it kind of surged up again and then had to be clamped down on again. But as late as 2007, here's a, a, a little map of let's say, areas affected by Naxalite insurgencies. And I mean, we have, you know, West Bengal is very much affected. This is a region between Calcutta and Patna, two cities you know, feature in this film. Uh, but you have this whole kind of red corridor that goes right down to, you know, through the middle of uh, India, uh, right down to Kerala, in fact. I mean, Kerala is not that involved. But you see this area around Hyderabad is actually also quite uh, heavily affected in the kind of let's say, in more recent years. Uh, it, it's since died down significantly since then. So 2007 was really the, the latest high point of uh, kind of peasant uh, uprisings. Uh, this, is, this is what happened to the CPIML, though. Uh, <laughs> just so that I'd show you the uh, current list of splinter groups that uh, find their origins with, uh, from the CPIML. Uh, there's quite a few of them. The main one that still advocates this people's war strategy is down here. Uh, the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist Mahadi Mukherjee, uh, who's still like, yeah, we've got to go out and like the peasants have to like um, take up arms. Uh, most of the others have abandoned this strategy and are kind of you know, uh, a little bit more reconciled to, I guess, a tr more traditional model of revolutionary politics. Um, so that was a little bit of context about what was going on in West Bengal uh, at the time. In a sense, I would argue, and I think my predecessors who have spoken about uh, the other two films in the trilogy would have echoed or have did echo this, that the Naxalite uprising is in, is in a sense a kind of structuring absence in all three films of the Calcutta trilogy. It's something that uh, is not often 
directly present in these films, but is always the thing that's just outside of the films, let's say. It's like the thing that's structuring them from uh, without. It's most directly addressed in Pratidwande, where the uh, brother of Siddhartha is actually kind of, you know, very directly uh, depicted as, as a student activist, so kind of um, you know, active or militant in solidarity with the kind of peasant uprising. In Simabada, the I would argue the Naxalite uprising is probably depicted in the most oblique way, but I think it's still quite fascinating. Uh, it's really present above all in what film theorists would term the or champ of the film, that is to say off screen, not on the screen per se, but in the kind of off screen space of the film. And most particularly, uh, it is alluded to and kind of present uh, on the soundtrack of the film. You hear from within their apartment, the sound of gunfire and bombings uh, at night. And the characters even mention this like, as if it's the most normal thing in the world. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, it's a bit annoying. Like, there's, there's one point where uh, I think um, Dolan, the, the wife of uh, Shai Malendu, says something like, oh, because they're up on the eighth floor in this kind of very modern apartment building. She says, that's really great up here. You don't get the mosquitoes, like you don't get the dust and so on that you would get on the ground floor. Uh, yeah, the only annoying thing is this constant sound of gunfire every night, like from these students, like being like, or shooting like police and getting shot at by police. Uh, and that's just like, a, just a regular topic of discussion. Like it's, it just seems to be part of their daily reality that they don't seem to be really uh, giving much thought to. There is, in essence, in the film, among the characters of the film, at least, uh, a repression of the political, a repression of the politics, the very pitched political struggle that is happening uh, at this time. And I would argue this is a kind of necessary repression for Shai Melendu to do what he does, to be uh, functional in his particular class position here and as, you know, as a kind of member of the, of the managerial uh, class. What I find fi quite interesting, though, is when we get to the moment that the factory uh, is on strike, that the factory workers go on strike, you do see the sudden in a sense, insurgence of the working class onto the screen, which you haven't seen, which has kind of been blocked out of the film uh, up until then, but kind of close to the end of the film, you suddenly do see the workers in the factory uh, going on strike, uh, like you know, kind of stopping the machinery and so on and so forth and kind of rising up, um, you know, ho hoisting up the banners and so on and so forth. And it is actually quite interesting because Satyajit Ray, I think he's not necessarily a filmmaker who many people would associate with a kind of montage aesthetics. But here you have one of two, uh, I think, really strong and palpable montage sequences in the film where you get this almost very classical parallel montage effect, a kind of cross-cutting between you know, workers storming the factory, occupying it, going on strike, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then uh, Shia Malendu in his very cushy corporate office uh, kind of very, very content about how things are going. Even it looks like it's all bad for him. He's like, "Oh, your own factory is on strike." Actually, he's quite, quite satisfied with how things are going. Uh, of course, you know we can talk about montage. Uh, you have to talk about the kind of Soviet legacy. Uh, Satyajit Ray very much. Uh, you know, he definitely knew the Soviet uh, filmmakers very well. These were some of the films that were most prominently shown in the kind of you know Calcutta Film Societies, partly as a result of kind of Soviet, I guess, cultural diplomacy uh, at the time or even in earlier decades. Uh, there is, I would argue, even a very overt nod to Eisenstein's, uh, you know, Battleship Potemkin in particular, which is, you might remember the, the, the breakthrough moment in Battleship Potemkin when the, when the sailors uh, go on mutiny uh, and they've like, they finally had enough, uh, is when one of them has this plate of food and he just looks at it. the food is so disgusting. Like, what? How can they treat us like this? Like giving us this this maggoty, maggot infested garbage. And he just picks up the plate and smashes it on the ground. Like enough's enough. I'm smashing the plate. That's the that's the signal for us to like mutiny to you know to launch a, a pitch battle against the officer class. And we see that same gesture in the, the key moment when the strike breaks out in Sima uh, Sima Bada, where you know a worker grabs one of their plates and just kind of like smashes it on the table. Uh, and I think that's a a very conscious illusion on the part of Satyajit Ray. He knew his film history. He knew his Soviets. Anyway, he was like, I don't think that was necessarily uh, coincidental. Um, 
So I've done my take. Now I'm going to do my double take, uh, which is that, you know, that's the, let's say, political uh, side of, uh, of the film, the kind of um, context of the Naxalite uprising, and then this kind of you know, the, the uh, factory strike in, in the uh, narrative of the film. The other side of the film is the relationship with, between Shia Melendu and Tutu, which is a uh, distinct, let's say, focus of the film. Uh, there is a palpable sexual tension between the two figures. Uh, they are constantly kind of joking with each other and essentially flirting with each other throughout the whole film. Uh, Tutu is very starkly contrasted with Dolan uh, in the film. Uh, she's seen as she's someone who is more, I don't know, like, let's say, has more insight <laughs> into things uh, a little bit. Uh, there is, of course, a taboo nature to this relationship. She's, his, she's Shai Melendu's sister-in-law. It should be inconceivable that they, you know, would have a, you know, a relationship that's, like, totally out of question. Um, and yet they're kind of constantly playing with this possibility in their film. It's very, and they never... Uh, you know, there, there, and I would argue also there is a genuine connection between them. I mean, this isn't like just like, uh, I don't know, uh, manipulation or something. There, there does seem to be a real substance to a potential relationship between uh, Shia Melendu and Tutu, uh, but it is never consummated. Uh, it only manifests itself in this kind of subtle game of gazes and illusions and playfulness and so on and so forth. Um, because you know they, it's a taboo is too strong. They can't. They can't like cross the threshold. Let's say, uh, Tutu is something of a moral voice in the film. She very distinctly represents the path that wasn't chosen by Shia Melendu. That, that is to say, he should have remained faithful to himself and stayed on the academic path, uh, become an English professor. Because that's like obviously, obviously, being an academic is the no the noblest thing you can do in life. Uh, instead, he's betrayed that and joined the corporate world. Uh, and there's all, and there is this kind of sense from her of like reprobation uh, about that choice, uh, even if it's the thing that enables him to have this kind of very glamorous, very prosperous lifestyle. Somehow he's lost his soul in the eyes of Tutu, uh, and this guy I think comes through very strongly in a, a scene kind of around halfway through the film where they both wake up early in the morning. So Dolan is still sleeping; she's sleeping in. You know they were out the previous night; they had a party the previous night. They both wake up early in the morning. There's a very, there's a very heavy uh, vibe in the air. And at one point she gets up and she starts arranging the books on uh, Shia Melendu's bookshelf. And there is a sense there that uh, this is an aspect of his life that he's totally neglected. She has to be the one to be like, no, like you gotta, you gotta like, look at these books. Like you gotta, these are books. And for him, they've just become basically like wall art or something. You know, these are not books that he's reading. They just sit on the shelf, uh, haven't been read for probably years. Um, you know, if Dolan herself at one point says, "I don't have, I don't, I don't read anymore," like I just lost the interest in it, and so on and so forth. Tutu still, still has this kind of thirst for knowledge, thirst for learning, thirst for literature uh, that Shia Melendu and uh, has seemed to have seemed to have seems to have lost. Um, at the end of the film, when and sorry, this is all kind of spoiler stuff, but like you're in the wrong place if you don't want spoilers. Um, Tutu uh, ends up rejecting Shia Melendu uh, when she finds, you know, that she's always she's kind of has this attraction to him. It's possibly something that doesn't dare speak its name, uh, but finally, when she cottons on to what he's actually done, that he's been the one like manipulating things behind the scenes, that he was the one like responsible for the strike, that you know very disastrous ramifications for like people, like, you know, people getting injured and so on and so forth. Uh, she finds this out or she realizes it. She, she, it dawns on her that that's what's happened. And so Shai Melendu at his kind of supposedly his moment of his kind of greatest victory in life, he's managed to join the corporate boardroom, gets this kind of very silent but definitive rejection from Tutu, just this kind of look from her that is like, you know, how could you do this? Uh, and that's a point where I think Vincent said at the start, these are the, you know, Satyajit Ray's films are ones that really, I mean, very strikingly so for the time, focus on um, female subjectivity. And these, this trilogy is something of an exception in that, in the sense that they, they do seem to focus on the kind of the, the male figures, the masculine figures. At this moment in the film, like the subjectivity flips and we're in, we're, we're with Tutul at this point. We're like in her world. We're like, we're... Uh, identifying with her subjective position 
uh, at that distinct point. And it becomes very palpable at one particular moment in the film, uh, very close to the end, where they go and visit a cabaret bar. And again, we get another weird parallel montage sequence that cuts very uh, regularly uh, or almost like rigorously between uh, Tutul kind of thinking about what's actually happening and a cabaret dancer, kind of almost naked cabaret dancer, kind of um, frolicking before them. Uh, and how to read that sequence, how to read that, that act of montage in Ray's film, uh, I think, you know, I'll leave that to discussion because I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, but I want to uh, just leave the, uh, my last final point with something of a, I guess, a, a strange serendipitous connection to a seminar I was teaching uh, yesterday, uh, on Alan Badu and Alan Badu has in one text, he talks about cinema. Uh, well, there was this kind of this, this modernist moment of cinema that were it's big question. This is kind of like the, you know, the real modern, the new wave era, the 60s, c- cinema of the sixties and the seventies, political modernism, let's say, uh, really the motor force behind that was this kind of focus on the big victory that like society could be changed you could use cinema to change society i mean you had to you need to make a new cinema in order to create a new society and this is uh this was something that was possible it was like feasible it was on the horizon it wasn't insured necessarily and certainly in the end wasn't insured uh but somehow that was the question that was structuring uh, the cinema of this period of the 60s and the 70s in particular and alan Badu has the i guess the has had to come to terms with the fact that that moment is over. Uh, that moment was saturated. You have the kind of big, kind of I guess, reactionary wave of the 1980s and the 1990s. And the cinema that comes after that, it no longer has that kind of modernist faith in any kind of possible big victory. Uh, but at least what it could have uh, or could envision what could be the kind of substance of films in the contemporary era are little victories. Uh, whatever they might be, just the smallest little things. It does. It's not necessarily like the working class overthrowing a capitalist state and instituting a, a, a classless society uh, or a dictatorship of the proletariat, however you want to phrase it. Uh, it could just be like two people have a connection and like that's like, you know, that happens. Uh, this is, I guess, I would argue the tragedy of the film is not so much like the failure of class struggle politics because I don't think Satyajit Ray's Moder- modernism, modernity was ever really mobilized by that kind of a faith. He always had a bit of a distance or a skepticism about that kind of politics. He never went in all in in a way that, let's say, Godard or Glauber Rocha or any other uh, figure, uh, you know, certain other figures from this kind of era of political modernity did. Uh, but the tragedy, the real tragedy of the film is the failure of the little victory that at least Shia Melendu uh, and Tutu, like, you know, Shia Melendu couldn't, could have avoided. Uh, like betraying his principles and could have ended up with the woman who was actually meant for him, namely Tutu. Uh, instead, he's like stuck in this corporate boardroom with this hag of a wife. Uh, and like his life is going to be miserable uh, from this point onwards, despite the fact that it's so kind of outwardly successful. So that's the point I'm going to end on. Uh, we'll break for 10 minutes and then we'll watch the film and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Uh, I'll be keen to are very, very keen to hear your thoughts on the film. So, yeah, enjoy the screening. You sort of hinted at the auto, at a possible autobiographical reading of the film. Um, there's the Tagore connection. Show me that Tagore is part of the Tagore family. Um, the Ray family has a connection to the Tagore family. He, uh, Ray himself, went to uh, Shantini Katon, the um, Reform University that Tagore had founded. He studied art, dropped out, um, <coughs> went back to Kolkata, and actually uh, started working in advertising. And in a way, transitioned out of advertising and book design to um, to become a film director. So there's some analogies to the character in this film. But then again, you might say that he um, found his calling in cinema uh, and left advertising behind. 
though, I mean, if you look at, by the way, if you look at Ray's work as an advertising and as an advertising art artist and a graphic designer, um, it actually makes sense to see it as part and parcel of his entire oeuvre. Um, so it's not like he rejected the world of advertising and wanted to do something completely different and wanted to be an artist. Um, one possible reading of his biographical tra trajectory is all, uh, would also be to say that he left art school because of the strictures of being a modern artist and of because of the liberty afforded him by the more mundane profession of of being a graphic artist so there's there's definitely at least an ambiguity with regards to the business uh that that his protagonist is in here but at the same time <coughs> um Shamila Tagore of course is the actress that um, plays Opu's wife in, in the second of the Opu trilogy film and then comes back as Davy, uh, as as we saw last week, and at this point is an absolutely a major star of Indian cinema. So she's the sort of the, the pivot of the film. Um, she is <coughs> the actress and the protagonist that audiences would have come to see and that he would have used to sell the film uh, as a commercial proposition. But then there's the Tagore name, and it's sort of, you know, she brings that legacy back into it, and um, there seems to be this whole ambiguity. So it's quite possible to, to, to have a biographical reading of the film, uh, though I usually do not en <laughs> endorse these kinds of readings. Um, but but it, uh, there's, there's definitely... Um, that layer there and at the same time as you pointed out beautifully um in discussing the political background leading up to the wonderful list of the little fraction uh splinter group of the marxist party uh this is this is in a period of extreme political turmoil and also extreme political violence it's not just the nationalite movement but it's actually the you know the communist party after the takeover of bengal uh, went on a pretty violent campaign of suppressing their political enemies with levels of <coughs> um, violence that are comparable to the kind of uh, sectional violence that we're seeing today again. But that, of course, has a long tradition in India um, in the 20th uh, century. And all of that is only hinted at. It's sort of excluded. Um, so I'm, I'm maybe to start the discussion, I'm really interested in getting back to the star performance of Shamil Tagore in this film and how you know how she anchors the film, but also sets up the stage for this absolutely devastating final scene of the averted case, which is like a death sentence uh, for, for the protagonist at, at the moment of his greatest social triumph. Maybe you can say something more about that performance. Yeah, well, and it how is it's, a, yeah, how it's contrasted with uh, with the other female performances in the film. Yeah, I mean, it is a it is a quietly devastating ending. Uh, I think which Satyajit Ray is a master at giving us that with that climax at the end of so many mm -hmm. of these films. This kind of emotional climax, but very like, um, let's say, subtly done, um, and that that fade out uh, effect. Um, what I would say, uh, to answer a few of the points brought up there, uh, I mean, I think you could read it a little bit as Satyajit Ray, the, like a kind of a contrafactual autobiography or something. Like this is the life he could have led, but like found the prospect so abhorrent that he kind of quickly changed course. I mean, he wasn't exactly like... It's, it's the uh, life from which cinema saved him. Cinema saved him from becoming Shia Melinda. <laughs> um which uh i mean he wasn't exactly that character because he was kind of a what you I don't, nowadays would be called a creative right which is shy melinda is not really he's more just a managerial figure um but nonetheless this was a world that he clearly uh was not comfortable in and and fled that world uh very quickly um and you know, luckily for us uh, and for him the cinema kind of was his uh his refuge um, but no, I think it's I think it's really important to bring up uh, Shamila Tago's performance and and the character of Tutu because this this it is kind of like a double take in that sense because we we go into this film. I mean, that's interesting that 
the 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 PR around the film is centered on her more, but certainly the way that the film is narratively structured, it starts out as a film about Shia Melendu. Uh, you know, he's the narrator. He gives us his history. We think, okay, oh, this is this is one of these like the the, the male centered films in such a race uh, oeuvre. But over the course of the film, it's really we're, we as spectators are doing a double take. We're, we thought we were watching a film about this guy, but actually we're watching a film about Tutu. And she's the actual emotional center of the film and what's going through her. And that becomes very clear in the cabaret scene where, you know, you get the very intense close up of her gaze, uh, which you like, you have a, a much more empathetic or identificatory relationship with her at that point than you've had at any point in the film uh, up until then. Um, so that's when, it, that's when you do the double take, you're like, oh, this film's really about her. That's about what yeah. she's going through. And, the turmoil that she has, I think, because she does love this guy. Uh, and she looked up to him. She's probably looked up. It seems like she's had a crush on him for like, you know, 10 years or something. And her sister got, got in the way of it. Um, but then she starts, but he's disappointed her on this kind of profound level. And she is having this reckoning with herself. Like, why? Wh what was I seeing in him? Like, was I wrong? Like, you know, it, like she's going through this kind of total mental um, recalibration, I guess. Uh, and when she just, you know, decides that there's, there's nothing, I mean, she doesn't want anything more of it, right? Um, and I think Shamila Tago's talents as an actress were able to pull off this kind of, like this, like subtly kidnapping the film <laughs> from who it's supposed to be about. Um, I mean, it's another layer to her character, which is, it's kind of intimated that she herself is, if not a Maoist, at least a, 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 boyfriend. a militant let's say in the yeah. broader sense of the term and i mean the way you're talking about like this kind of pervasive level of violence in uh, west bengal at the time i mean just the way she casually says like imagine if a bomb went off in this race course like and it's like this glint in her eye like that'd be pretty cool actually <laughs> <laughs> like uh she's, she's the kind of person who has these thoughts and you know it's just like uh you know, this is a kind of constant insinuation in the film. It's never spelt out literally, but it does seem to be pretty strongly uh, inferred that that's what she's getting up to in her student kind of milieu, let's say. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we never learn much about the boyfriend, but... Uh, it's also suggested that he, at one point, I don't, they're joking, so who knows what they're, what they're like, ah, oh, you know, he's a revolutionary too or something. Could, and then she said, could be. Yeah, exactly. Uh, she's, but, uh, she's, she's sort of keeping it under wraps. Just in, in terms of the production logic, I mean, he's betting on a complete unknown as the, uh, as the protagonist. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the man has the qualities to carry a film. The he looks like Jeff Goldblum, by the way. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum, yeah, the gla <laughs> maybe the, the glasses, very much that, that like the the Jeff Goldblum yeah. polka dot. Um, he also looks like a good friend of mine, so okay. like an Indian friend. Uh -huh. um, but but he's clearly someone who has star p uh, potential, and it's actually quite remarkable that he wouldn't follow up on this performance and and seek uh, a, a film career. So um, in in a way, just in in terms of the commercial logic of the of, of the production, it was safe for Ray to bet on this guy because he because knew he had he had, he had Chamil yeah. Togor in the film, and he, it was already clear that she was going to carry the film. But what's also interesting in terms of structure, not necessarily in terms of the weighting of the performance and the actress doesn't have the same kind of um, status, but in the, the go-between. Uh, oh, like Talukta said. No, the, the, the second, like in your um, succession, the second film of the trilogy. Oh, Jana Aranya. Yeah, Jana yeah, yeah, Aranya, yeah. exactly. Um, you also have this narrative trajectory where the female figure emerges as, in a way, the center of attention and the and the ethical center of mm -hmm. the film, even though she's a prostitute. But and and but but she's the one who says to the male protagonist, "I assume my choice, and you don't. You don't respect my choice, and you don't assume the responsibility for your choices." And so, in a way, <clears throat> as destitute and broken as she is, she has the same kind of power and integrity that the Shamila Tagore character has in, like Tutul has in this film. Even though Tutul, of course, remains sort of the pure intellectual and the one who 
who in a way is the, the warden of what he could have been and probably should have been. Um, so the structural analogy of the two films is something that struck me while we we were watching them, that, that you have an almost mm. like a generic structure, you know, with the, mm. the young professional male who loses his, ma uh, who loses his way, loses his e ethical core, betrays his potential calling and encounters a woman who sort of uh, holds a mirror up to him and and uh, provides a model of what it would mean to assume responsibility for their lives uh, uh, in a situation like that. So uh, I don't know, it's just an observation. Yeah, I mean, okay, I mean, in Jana Aranya, this guy, he's like, um, moment of moral corruption is that he has to chaperone this uh other guy around finding him a prostitute essentially all night long uh and and there's a very parallel scenario here that it's like it's not it's not about that per se but it's about like kind of uh in instead it's kind of like setting off this like workers insurrection <laughs> for your own uh kind of machiavellian purposes uh, but in both in both senses yeah it's this kind of sense of like you really betrayed something profound that you thought you had uh and the way he also the chilling the most chilling scene in this film is when he when then he and talak start laughing about the night watchman like being nearly killed <laughs> and it's like oh yeah we could leave him a wreath like that would be uh that would be funny um and that's when you feel like oh he's kind of dead inside at this point you know like he's like he's really lost a part of his soul in a sense um, yeah, he should have been, should have become a professor. He should have, that's what he was. Uh, that's that. Mm. That's what he should have done in life. Uh, that's what everyone should do in life. Uh, but um, but I had another one last there. thing before yeah. we open uh, to the public. I mean, you focus very much on on the issue of class, mm -hmm. but that scene, and then it's a, a theme throughout the film, uh, has a lot to do with cost. Mm -hmm has to do with the fact that, um, I mean, India's endemic problem, we've said it many times, is that labor is too cheap and um, there's no social mobility uh, or very little. Um, and the, 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 the guard, of course, is a lower cost uh, person, not someone who would be called Chatterjee or Banerjee or, you know, any of the upper cost Brahmin uh, names that the main characters uh, have, um, and so that's also it, it's a cost effect. You know, his life is, is to them in that moment of crisis worth less than theirs. It's very clear. Yeah, yeah. And then um, there's the whole thing with the servants, who one of whom is uh, coded as Muslim, probably. Uh, a, a an East, somebody from East Bengal, from Bangladesh, or uh, certainly someone who, after partition, has a much lower social status than, than the people here. Um, having a servant like that in the apartment is absolutely nothing unusual for a bourgeois family at the time, but it's very, very clear that uh, the status of the servant is, is uh, perennially and firmly inferior to that of anyone else in in the house, like the way he orders the lime juice. Mm -hmm. He sits down on the sofa and says, uh, lime with soda. Calls the name, says lime with soda. That's all he says. Doesn't say thank you or anything. Um, <coughs> and that's just a very, very clear order. And this is someone he lives with for all practical purposes. And so th those, those uh, uh, social structures are still very, very much built into uh, their daily lives and and sort of you know built into the modernist architecture that they of the building that they live in and that they in a way use to signal status and and having that um, servant in a house which is something that you would have had in any house if you had their social status uh, um, is is something profoundly pre-modern or anti-modern, but that persists in that particular setting. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's you know class is in a way the concept that 
the, the communists and would, in all their varieties, would try to mobilize to overcome the category of cost. And, and what the film shows is how, you know, deeply ingrained and perennial it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so, it, and so yep. the whole, you, you know, you can manipulate the union into doing whatever uh, in the name of class. And what really remains in place is the order of cost. Yeah, I mean, uh, you will, we also see that scene in the office where he starts berating a minion for leaving the fan on, and it's a completely humiliating experience. Uh, but this is, this is just a kind of normalized act by Shia Melinda. I mean, this is this is the dark side of his existence in the sense that he has this kind of army of servants who's kind of doing all the dirty work for him. And then we see that later he also has that in the factory that, you know, Talek Dai has this kind of secret network of agent provocateurs who are able to kind of uh, sow dissent if they if they want it, you know, it's like, um, which is a, a very dicey thing to show, I think, in a film. <laughs> That's like, uh, yeah, yeah, half the time when there's strikes, it's just like the bourgeoisie deliberately provoking them uh, for their own ends. Um, but what I want to say about, I mean, cars, it's an interesting question in this film because, I, I mean, Shai Melinda himself, he seems pretty convinced that he is there and on merits. Um, and I mean, it, there's a quite, quite the contrast with the other two episodes in this trilogy in the sense that in both of the other episodes, you see the uh, just tremendously debilitating and dispiriting experience of going through the interview process, like in the civil service or whatever. And it's like, people getting asked like how what does the moon weigh and all this kind of stuff and there are like a thousand um like applicants for like 10 positions and they're all like completely stressed out and it's like um just this absolute nightmare experience and then he chime in he just breezes through the process He's like yeah i just had an interview and they asked me a couple of questions and i got the job and it was all you know it was all like you know i was first at uni i mean just as he just feels like he's uh kind of on the the primrose path to success yeah. in a sense um he doesn't i don't think he perceives himself as the beneficiary of a caste system he just he's, no, no. he's just talented no, no, absolutely he's, just, he's got but the then again then again yeah. he um accepts his success as something that uh is uh, is due to him yeah yeah i mean yeah. he has, his he innate has the, right uh, and he sense. has the yeah. uh, educational attainment but he also has the name Mm, and he has yeah. he has the, the bourgeois status and and what's interesting about the other two films is that you in in those films you have people with uh, c clearly upper caste names same level of educational attainment and it doesn't help yeah yep. and it doesn't work so in a way it's it's about the crisis of the caste system but it's uh, uh, um, the the characters are in a way interesting because they live in a world where that privilege no longer works i mean it might be generational because he's about 10 years older than the characters in the other two films that he 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 was going through this in the Absolutely. 1960 Absolutely. right where yeah. that system was still kind of working i guess exactly um, exactly that's an important point by the time you get to 1970 yeah. it's not uh, but he's already made it through, so he's fine. No, that's so. that's absolutely an important point. In 1960, it was still working, and that's also why it's important for the film's narrative to mark the beginning of yeah. its professional yeah. ascent uh, by saying it was that and that day in 1960 yeah. when we arrived in Delhi and and I started working for this company. That that's actually true. Yes. So that's that's a big difference. Yeah, it's but also funny that right at the start of the film we get we get this weird prologue where it's like. I mean, it almost sounds like a newsreel, like a political news. It's like there are one million unemployed, there are millions of illiterate, unemployed people in Bangladesh, and so on. It's like, and I'm not one of them. <laughs> it just totally switches focus. It's like you think you're getting this hard-hitting social commentary, but actually, it's it's a it's a ruse, right? It's yeah. like totally flips. And then the focus. next three films are a corporate film about the factory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, just uh, one one last little thing. Uh, it's always important to remind ourselves that. The family in Opu is also a Brahmin family, which has fallen on hard times. But there, it's partly because they do the the, the father chooses not to have a professional career. He sort of sticks mm. to mm. Yep. the teaching role and the, the the role of the of the intellectual, and he basically chooses to be poor and to live uh, a life that is not uh, adequate to his social status. I'm sure there are questions from the audience. Yeah, I think we're I'm roving right here. There you go. 
Yes, uh, thanks very much for your lecture. Um, I have a slightly different take, uh, <laughs> that uh, me. or reading, or whatever. Um, I mean, your reading was very much focused on the love story, so to speak, on, let's say, ethical choices. Uh, for me, the film is much more about sociology. Um, and why I would argue like that is, for example, it's also about language, right? I mean, the act of God as the excuse for not getting the penalty and so on is, of course, it's a heresy, right? I mean, that's you don't use actually God's name or abuse it in this way. And language is, of course, a sociological institution. And we also see it in the very beginning in the uh, in how how um, our main protagonist uh, talks about the 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 ad, he says, "Okay, it should have been an Iraqi girl that would be more authentic." You could say the same thing today. I mean, so this abuse of language all the time, uh, this commodification of language, is just the result of the cynicism of capitalism of this world. And what I find more important in the final scene, instead of the averted gaze, is she takes off the wristwatch. Well, you don't need wristwatches in smaller towns or in villages. You need that in big cities in terms of consumptions, getting to a date, being in time, in five minutes I'm there, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, urban life is, of course, heavily <coughs> formed by these technologies. Um, and I would say, it's a trap if we fall. I mean, if we if we if we reduce this story to uh, an ethical reading, what we do is we fall into the trap of the bourgeois ideology. You always have a choice, and blah blah blah. It's not really like that, and we are, we cannot be sure if her final move will be final. It's just final for the film, of course. Uh, because maybe she has to go back and maybe the pressure from the family will be stronger. She's over 30, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is, of course, a dark <coughs> perspective for her. But as we know, even uh, in a village, there are very strong, I mean, uh, implications, uh, sociological implications for your quote-unquote personal or individual life. So what we see is the destruction of the public life. Okay, she says... And one uh, and one part, she says goodbye, Calcutta. Okay, that's about the cultural imperialism, blah blah blah, of the Western world. Uh, and and the second thing is, um, sorry, I just lost my uh, thread, but okay, I think that's enough for a moment. I, mean, I guess what I would say, I, yeah, you're in a sense, you're right. I was kind of making a, a unwittingly a kind of Sartrean argument <laughs> about the free will of the character. He could have done it. He could have take an alternative path and you're arguing more for a kind of de deterministic model let's say like he couldn't have acted differently given the circumstances uh he's just a cog in the machine uh is that i mean that's kind of and 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 to and to also is i mean she's gonna end up inevitably corrupted by this world as well is that the it's like she, because she, she'll marry this, she'll marry this other guy who she's talking about. He's probably an asshole as well, and you know, like, he's sure. probably one of those like student revolutionaries who then like goes corporate later. I mean, like, everyone's doomed. This is. Yep. God's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. But he also has to lift the camera so that we see the ventilator. <laughs> it, the, the ventilator is working. It's very important to have the ventilator in the image. Yes, yes. The advertising is continuing and the machine is continuing to work. Uh, just, just two little uh, add-ons. Um, regarding language, I mean, it's, uh, it's explicitly it's, uh, made a topic. Um, in the end, she says, I was afraid to come to the city and find someone who would no longer speak Bangla. Um, and that also points to the status of Bengali as a literary, literary language and uh, his commitment to literature. And then the, 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 the Tamil character is really interesting, the, the sort of the quasi father figure mm -hmm. who uh, treats him to a Tamil proverb 
to give him advice in how to handle this uh, situation, um, which is also a pointer uh, 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 towards the linguistic diversity, cultural diversity of India. And so, oops, and so they they sort of meet uh, in in a world of corporate language, uh, but it's very much about retaining um, your linguistic roots in a way and and the other thing i was just thinking if this were a, a sarah chandra novel it would be only the one the first 120 pages in an 800 page novel and they would cross path again and again over 30 years and uh, in the end they'd be happy but uh, <laughs> but it really takes time um uh, so yeah it's not entirely excluded that he basically throws away his career and goes back to Patna and marries her yeah, well, we I mean, but Could what be. did you say to get back on the question of language? What did you say that Jacques Monk called English the language of the language of the empire? The language, of, but it's also the language. But he I means mean, America. Yeah, but it's also just it's the language of, like, it's the language of shopkeepers. You know, it's the language of the English. petty bourgeoisie. It's the language of advertising. You know, and this is the, the we have this weird. I mean, which we've seen a lot of Satyajit Ray films. This kind of like dropping in and out of English. Uh, as it's language, but here it's very clearly spelled out that English is like it's this kind of, it's not even English. It's advertising speak that kind of starts uh, invading the linguistic world of these characters, um, and it, it's. I mean, you know, in an in an English speaking world, you can feel that when someone starts talking in that kind of ad speak mode, uh, and here it's made much more flag flagrant because they're alternating between uh, Bengali and uh, and this kind of. Uh, debased <laughs> form of an already debased language. Uh, but I think there was some... Yes, Anna. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to come back to the discussion you were having uh, in the beginning on the figure of Tutul. And I think we could actually take this a little further, not just arguing that she becomes the main character of the film, but that she actually takes over the role of the director. Um, and I remember that in the last lecture on... Uh, not the last one, but the one on uh, Middleman... Um, there was this idea of uh, Ray implementing kind of an ethnographical uh, way of filming, um, of staying with the trouble. And I think that's partly what she does when she comes to Calcutta. She's basically observing all the time. She's evaluating, she's observing, especially different social spaces. For example, I found really imp impressive the sequence when they go to the beauty salon and she gets out of the car just to watch for two minutes, just to observe, and the camera's really um, com coming close to all those different um, devices in the beauty salon. And the other thing that she does is not just ethnographically observing, but, but also kind of commenting on choices that Ray made for filmmaking when um, she gets to Calcutta first. And I think they're driving around in, in a car. Um, they're talking about kind of um, the rev revolution and uh, everything that's going on with the protests. Um, and they ask her, did you come to Calcutta to observe the revolutionaries? And she answers, no, I came here to um, watch the ones who are not revolutionaries. And that's basically what, what Ray does in the film, isn't it? Or what he does uh, throughout the um, tr whole trilogy, um, I guess. Um, and then um, just one other moment that I that I noticed uh, throughout the film where something similar happens is when they're discussing in the apartment and they're discussing about divorcing and kind of making fun of, ha, 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 I could marry your sister-in-law and this and that. She starts clapping and she comments on that dialogue saying, wow, this is a particular uh, conversation you're having here. So she again takes over this role of kind of commenting on, f on choices um, of the script, of the directing, of uh, everything that's yeah, kind of making the film. So, yeah. Uh, that, that's a really good point. I think there, there was also one moment in the film that struck me too where, uh, like, um, Shai Malendu, like, right at the end, he gives himself away by, like, when his rival is like, ah, like, oh, you, there's all these strikes going on. And and he starts, like, s like scrunching up this uh, serviette on the table. Like, you could see the tension. Like, that's... And she sees what he's doing, and that's what really, like tips her off and all that's what really like now the penny has dropped uh and it's not because of anything he's saying it's because of just this gesture he's making that's expressing his like extreme anxiety about kind of being found out like in her eyes that's what he's really worried about that she's figured out what he's actually ended up uh doing ironically enough there's something that she was joking about earlier that she's like oh you could just like so, you know 
start a strike in a factory. Oh, ha, ha, ha. And then, like, that's actually what he ends up doing. Uh, but, yeah, she's this kind of, uh, like, very um, uh, kind of incisive observer of everything that's going on around her. Uh, and then, again, there's the kind of contrast to this completely oblivious wife who just, like, isn't seeing anything that's going on around her. I mean, at least, uh, like... Like she's, she's also remarkably oblivious to the erotic uh, dynamic. Yes, absolutely. Sister. That's that. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but it's uh, I, I, I like the idea. It's 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 again sort of the double take idea. Um, I mean, one of the strongest scenes, of course, is the party scene with the 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 guy who's sort of looking at her <coughs> in a way that clearly causes her discomfort. And and uh, so, so the whole scene, the whole milieu is narrated through her. Through, through her discomfort, really. And that's, again, I think, in, uh, sort of an observational uh, technique. I was just thinking that uh, if you take the three films together as an analysis, <clears throat> uh, there's a connection to the Frankfurt School. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because basically, originally, in the 1920s, the, pro the, 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 the founding moment of the Frankfurt School was that the revolution didn't happen and that they put together Freud and Marx to explain why. Uh, so essentially the whole, the whole point of the Frankfurt uh, critical theory is to uh, explain why the revolution didn't happen, not how yeah, you can yeah. make it happen. And, and Philosophy uh, missed its chance to realize itself, as a Sorry? Said. Philosophy missed its chance to realize missed itself. Missed its chance to, to realize itself, and you know, that's what the combination of Freud and Marx allows you to understand. But you could say that here, uh, the, the three films together, in a way, are films about a revolutionary situation where the revolution doesn't happen. And the, the, the narration of cost in this film is an important element of that. You know, you cannot expect someone to start a revolution who uh, has uh, uh, basically a servant at home and treats him like that. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. Stephen. Yeah, um, a question first. Uh, do, do, you, do you know anything about the reception, particularly in this politicized period in India? How was that seen and judged politically? And a comment or a question of a different kind, maybe. Um, speculation about uh, whether Tulu uh, is involved in some sort of revolutionary things. Maybe, maybe not. But her reaction in the film seems to be not a political one, but a moral one, mm -hmm. extremely moral uh, and unpolitical in that sense. What does she expect? <laughs> he's doing his job. He's doing his job very well for his company, which he's been loyal to, as he says. He's just fulfilling the role of the capitalist Kaktamaska, which maybe is a different kind of a second take on it, that the film isn't that moral, but it's not through her eyes. She's disappointed in him and so on, but that we see what goes on in him and how easily he's corrupted. He's not even corrupted. He's doing the job that he's been paid to do and um, brushing away any kind of morality. Uh, we're doing the right thing, and they always do that that way is what his helper there I says. Would, yeah, yeah. No, I, but I would also say there's this moment of self-realization on the part of um, Tuttle that she, like, she sees how easy it is could happen to her as well. Uh, she's already kind of halfway down this path. Her, sister, uh, her sister's kind of like showing her this lifestyle that she could have, this future. You know, that moment in the uh, in the cabaret club where it's like, you know, we like our room is also like open to honeymoon couples. You know, like that's a, I mean, it's kind of a seedy line. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a kind of, uh, I think, terror that she feels about this this prospect that she'll just succumb to the same kind of fate and i think that's that's why you get the this kind of alternation with the cabaret dancer because it's like she has i think she feels like she's being prostituted at this point i mean that to me is the i would read that or that she's like recoiling at the idea that that's actually what has been happening to her and she has to kind of put a stop to it uh at that at that moment like that's the moment where she realizes i mean it's she is offended at what shia melinda has been doing but also seeing how she herself could be kind of end up trapped in the uh, in the same logic as far as the reception of the film i mean the cpi my cpi ml did not like Sachi ray's films i can say that <laughs> um strangely enough though it had at least according to baron chanda uh, in his kind of uh, memoirs about the film it did have a 
ironically, like, uh, an ironic popularity amongst the exact sector of the population that it seems to be very scathing towards, i.e. corporate middle-aged men who are like, ah, that's such a cool guy. I want to dress like him and, like, strut my stuff and so on. Like, they, they, they like, like, identified with his character, like, without seeing the kind of critical level of or perceiving or like maybe having this kind of double perception of like at the one hand maybe you do understand but still like like he's a, he's a you know you can see the attraction of the guy he's a like he's a cool guy he, like you do want to be like him to a certain degree uh just not all the unsavory <laughs> sides of his character yeah. so but there was a kind of you know the way he dresses too is very striking like i think that was also there was a kind of a like a Baron Chanda look for a while, I guess. Those are yeah. good suits. Yeah, even his, even his homewares and amazing very, very shirts and stuff. So yeah. He's just like lounging around his house in. So. He has the best suits. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, if you think of a film like American Psycho, that can also be dangerous. You, should, you shouldn't <laughs> outdress your superior <laughs> corporate structure, and he's dangerous. He's, f- he's flirting that. with that danger. Yeah, damn good suits. Um, I, I, I just want to want to add something to to what Stephen was raising. Um, what's really interesting, and I mean, the film spends a lot of time making clear that there's a difference, is that the competitor always talks to his wife. He mm-hmm. always calls her, keeps her up on the latest news, yeah, and basically, yeah. it's their joint, it's their marriage. It's a joint project, project for them. It's a joint yeah. project. Yeah. He does it yeah. for his wife. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and. And she's probably helping him, like, kind of strategize and, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, she helps yeah. strategize. And so she's part of the game. Um, uh, the protagonist's wife is absolutely ignorant of everything. Uh, Tutul knows about it. But, and then he says, because she asked. But in a way, to use another contemporary reference, there's something of Walter White in him. Mm-hmm. He does it for himself. <laughs> he wants to be good at this. And uh, again, so it's a, very, very Walter. The, the know, sequel another, of this film has him opening a meth lab in yeah, his basement. Exactly, is that exactly. the? <laughs> so is that where this is going to end it's up? Not just Don Draper, but Walter White. <laughs> and Walter White again, you know, it's left the, the promising. Yeah, yeah. The male anti-heroes of quality TV. Yes, in the early yes 20th exactly. Century. They're all basically. They're all, they're they're all descendants all, of uh, of they've, they've Baron Chanda's from from mature yeah. Ray films. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very true. From Miller. Yeah, I just wanted to, maybe it's unqualified because honestly, I, d- I couldn't see the whole movie because I was projecting it. So I couldn't see it in one flow. But um, what what I was seeing is that um, he really um, depicted this generation very well because I can remember this is the generation of my parents and it's also this generation which was really trapped in between liberating themselves still from colonialism because it was just um, 25 years ago and um, and also being modern, also the women at that time that was like when they're lucky or when they were in a higher caste and they had prog- uh, progressive parents, they were allowed to study and they were even allowed to work in this job for a little bit, but still they ended up in an arranged marriage. So, and this was kind of this thing, which was also, I don't know, it was like for this generation, it was really paradox because on the one hand, they somehow they took advantage also of this colonialism or what was left of it is um, really also this this um, the um, no, the, the, the fabriken the, what's the the factories you know and um, if you're lucky to have work and but you must keep in mind at this time was also when you were in the lower caste you were not really even though Gandhi was really fighting for it that there that the caste system would be dissolved. But um, the thing is that uh, still, when you were in a lower caste, the chances that you could study uh, and that you could have a job what, which really brings money or gives you some reputation was really, really low. And I think for the the men, it was it didn't change really in that way like for women because they were really trapped in this... Um, being on the edge of liberate themselves from from these arranged marriage and be, and being more emancipated, um, but then on the other side you had all, you had all these layers from which they had 
have to liberate themselves. And even now, when you when you go to India now, it's like I saw a documentary and they said um, even in big cities, um, they say that young people again go back to asking their parents to arrange a marriage. It's not like in like uh, 50 years ago that they say, okay, this is your husband, you see him <laughs> on the day of the marriage. But still, it's like the, the tenants is going back to uh, my parents will know best which which man they choose for me. So that's, yeah. I think India is in that way very paradox. And sometimes I have the feeling Indians also don't have the overview of <laughs> like their mentality. It's a little bit, it's really complex. I, I mean, yeah, here it's interesting because I, I don't think it's necessarily an arranged marriage in the strict sense of the term, but uh, he's married, he's the star student who's married the daughter of his professor. There's something a little bit, too perfect about that or something um and also the way he talks about it right at the start of the film it's like oh, i had six weeks before i needed to start my job so i like did what i had to do like i got married <laughs> like it's a very it's also a very like prosaic way of describing like uh, actually getting married but to bring up the generational issue i mean there's, there's there are generation gaps i guess in two directions in the film because there is a discussion at the party where they're talking about like the post generation uh, post independence generation like the generation who's younger who's 20 at this time, whatever, and they're the ones letting up bombs and shooting people uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but then there's also the, the uh, their parents' generation, Shia, Shia Melendu's parents' uh, generation who are just kind of treated like absolute dirt. Uh, like, not allowed to live with them. <laughs> I mean, you, but there's this pretext of the company won't let your parents live in the same apartment with you, and they're like, well, you can get around that, can't you? It's like, I don't really want to. Uh, and then they come and visit while he's having a party and he just kind of like shuffles them into this side room because like they would just be so embarrassing if they were actually like to kind of socialize with their party guests. Um, I think that's also another very quietly devastating scene in uh, in the film that just this kind of like uh, disregard for his own parents um, is, is quite shocking as well. Uh, Yeah. If in India, you really um, pay a lot of respect to your parents. I mean, the yeah, it's with. The, I mean, I don't. Yeah. Huh? The rule is keeping them very, <laughs> leaving the party. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if you if you disrespect them, because that's what I mean. It's like this pseudo modernization, maybe to to be in a Western way, like okay, you just you're in between disrespecting them and don't want to uh, disrespect them and don't know what to do. Yeah. yeah, but it's weird that I mean it's weird that the British company has this rule like your parents can't live. Why would they have that rule for a start? But it's like this a way of imposing a European model of the family as opposed to a more traditional Indian like multi generational like living situation with families. Like they 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 want to turn their managerial layers into like Europeans basically in their in their kind of social mores, and and he's kind of going along with it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe what's also important is that, that after that I think we should come. To oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been a long evening. Wow, it's nearly twelve o'clock. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll make it quick then. Okay. Cool. Um, there's also a criticism of the university system in mm -hmm. the cultural trilogy, right? I mean, yep. this is not paideia anymore. It's not enlightenment. People study there for completely other reasons. Okay. They don't want to study or learn. So that's. Deeply pessimistic. The Lernfabrik, that's what they're, they're just being pushed through. The yeah, yeah. And, and that's yeah. typical critical theory, too. And if you connect it with the racket theory part of the critical theory, then you can say that uh, uh, not the workers are instrumentalized, but the union leaders, so to speak. Okay? It's always, and it's not so much about the caste, it's, it's about, I mean, you can, the guy will get a promotion, his helper, his big helper will get a promotion, and, and the whole company will look better. Okay, for, for the outside. So it's always omerta, you know, like the typical mafia style. You don't mention it. You have the skeletons in the closet. You can use that later against the guy. Okay, that's Shakespeare too. I mean, I'll shut up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you can't stop Deutsch. Sie können auf Deutsch. Oh, um, 
Gut, also ich wollte nur sagen, dass mir die Szene, wo ähm, der Hauptdarsteller die Treppe hochläuft, mhm. die sich so in die Länge gezogen hat, dass die mir sehr gut gefallen hat und ähm, dass die ähm, so eine Art Freiheit auch gegeben hat. Man kann sicher jetzt vor dem Hintergrund der ganzen soziologischen und ähm, politischen und so weiter Betrachtungsweisen da alles Mögliche drauflegen, reininterpretieren, was das jetzt innerhalb dieser Karriere und dieser, dieses Weges bedeutet. Aber für mich hatte das auch so eine Freiheit, weil der eine Reduktion der Bilder auf einmal war und ähm, die Töne haben, also das Trappeln hat eine Rolle gespielt, also das fand ich ganz beeindruckend und hat dem ganzen Film für mich so eine, so eine Öffnung gegeben, auch nochmal. Ja, yeah. das wollte ich sagen, dass mir it das does, I mean, that's an interesting scene, because uh, it is, I guess, something that could be read in many different ways. Like the, yeah, there's a sense of uh, almost this opening or this Uh, freedom is like, ah, oh, I'll just walk up the stairs and, you know, I can do this and whatever. Um, but he seems to treat it all in good graces, walking up all eight flights of sweaters. Um, I mean, I think it's also this scent, this kind of uh, visual allegory for what he's had to go through. It's like, every, you know, he has, he has to do the social ascent every step of the way. Um, I, I would agree with um, the point that you're making, that the, the Gefühl der Freiheit. Ne? Also im Moment seines Triumphs, in the yeah. moment of supreme achievement, he's reduced to being ordinary like everyone else, having to walk the stairs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a yeah. Jacques Tati movie almost. It's like this uh -huh. ultimate modern apartment, but nothing works. Everything like is constantly malfunctioning. Uh, But I don't know. I don't know if this is a valid connection. But it also reminded me of the scene in Eisenstein's October, where you see Kerensky climbing up the stairs, just like infinitely climbing up the stairs, as this kind of Eisenstein trying to make fun of him as like this social striver, but who's like climbing upstairs but never actually getting anywhere. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm still with her. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I wouldn't. Uh, overemphasize the allegorical and mm -hmm. metaphorical point of it. It's a genius stroke in in terms of the rhythm of the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. The, to break the rhythm at that yeah. point and to have that lengthy scene. And as you said, you know, it's an evacuation of the images. Uh, yeah. Um, it's 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 really a great touch, and it creates an opening. And maybe without that, the ending would even be more brutal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah if there were no sense that he can also, you know, be thrown back to, uh, uh, like, his original state or to to um, uh, um, uh, an experience of equality with others who yeah. uh, have to struggle hard every day, um, it would be even more depressing. Shall we leave oh, it yeah. with that? <laughs> Let's end on that note. Let's Thank you so note. much for all the questions, for the discussion. Uh, well, we have a big break now. We have three months off until we yes, exactly. uh, kick back into gear with Moynak Biswas. Let it all settle. And then we resume yeah. with the Opu trilogy and Moynak yep. Biswas uh, will join us from Kolkata. Um, I think, what, what day in April? I think it's the 25th or the 24th, something like that. 24th, maybe. 24th. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Around that time. Hope to be seeing you there yeah. then. Thank you.